All right, Gary, are we on back there? We're running. I got Gary and Gary and Larry and Harry. That, that's Steve's next name. It's Harry and everybody. So, might, might get get under the downflow here a little. <laughs> this ain't right. You know, I, I, I preach I preach in Pakistan and there's 2,000 people sitting on the ground with no air conditioning and uh, I'm doing this. I kind of feel guilty. Anyway, need to pray for Pakistan because it's flooding all over the nation. The guy that I work with there requested prayers and so much going on in Pakistan. So, anyway, um, this morning, for some of you, it's going to be reruns. For several of you, you may not have heard some of these things, but I want to begin today by telling a story. If you don't know yet, I like stories. I mean, you know, Jesus told stories to illustrate a point. And I, I try to use the stories to illustrate. And I want to go back to my days at ECU, East Central University, which was how many years ago was I there, Phyllis? About 95. So it would have been about 1995. And there was a sociologist, sociology professor there. His name was Dr. Zellner. I don't know if anybody ever went to East Central and had Dr. Zellner. But Dr. Zellner was the resident atheist on campus. He had an atheist hotline that you could call where he would just attack attack anything that was Christian. And you get these young 18, 19-year-old kids coming into his sociology class, and they're coming from these denominational churches, and they've never witnessed anything like Dr. Zellner. And he would chew these kids up and spit them out. And he was just a notorious atheist, Dr. Zellner. Well, I had to take his class. And so I decided I wasn't going to tell him that I was a preacher until, <laughs> until he got to know me. And I went for a month. I went for a month before he found out. He, by then, he already liked me. And I'm the oldest person in the class, obviously. I was in my... My 40s, early 40s, maybe 41, 2. And so I go to, I'm in his class doing well, all kinds of discussion. And one day he came in and he just went on a rant talking about these crazy TV preachers and the Pentecostals and these charismatics and these tongue talkers and all the crazy all the crazy things that happened, I mean, he just, <clears throat> he went on a rant. And so we all just listened. And so as I was leaving class, he was right beside me, and I got to where I call him Doc. And that was okay. And he had just found out that I was a pastor. And I said, Doc, I said, I've been in this Pentecostal charismatic movement for the last 30 years or however many years I guess it would have been about the last 25 years and I said I said I've seen the good the bad and the ugly and how many of you know there's good bad and ugly oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And I said, I know all about it. I said, why don't you let me talk about it in class? He said, okay. You got it. The next fifth. The last 15 minutes of the next two class periods, he says, I first of all, I want you to talk about the bad. And then the next class period, you talk about the good. And so he introduced me to the next class. I get up in front of the front of the class, and they all, of course, he tell, tells them I'm a pastor, and I and I start telling them about all the charlatans. I tell them about the, all, all the phonies, all the people that manipulate for money and, and the crazy things that I've seen. How many of you have ever seen crazy things in churches, you know? I've seen them take up more offerings in one service than most people take up in six months. And, uh, and the money and, and just, I just talked about all the bad that I had seen. So then the next class period comes with me. And of course, they know you know, we're charismatic Pentecostal. And I got up and I said, you know what? I said, there's about 40 in the class. I said, you guys should have been with me last night. I said, I was in a crazy charismatic gathering and these people were going nuts. They were stomping their feet and clapping their hands and yelling and hollering and making all kinds of noise. I said, you, I said it was crazy. And then I said, and oh, by the way, Conowa won that game by one point. <laughs> and when I said that, he busted out laughing. And that's when I said, why is it that we want every area of our lives to be fun and exciting and celebrate and all of, except when we come to church. And then I spent the next 10 minutes talking about worship and the presence of God and celebrating Jesus. Got my A in that class. And did you know a friend of mine stayed in touch with Dr. Zellner and told me after he retired and moved back east that they said that he became a Christian Amen. before he passed away. Amen. That's a miracle. Chris? Steve Martin says atheists ain't got no song. Atheists ain't got no song. That's right. By Steve Martin. A quote by Steve Martin. Yeah, that's the truth. Anyway, that's my intro to my message because today, listen, today there is a war going on between different Christian groups over what is appropriate and what is inappropriate in worship. And listen, the Facebook Pharisees, and let me tell you what, a Pharisee today doesn't know he's a Pharisee. They attack everything. And anyway, the Facebook Pharisees are making videos and podcasts that brutally attack anything that is different than what they believe or what they do. I post all the time to these people. I say, we should never be so foolish to believe that God only blesses what we do. So as a pastor, I, I cannot worry about what other churches do or what they believe, but this morning I'm going to tell you what I believe. And many of you know, but I'm going to talk about celebration. Everybody say celebration. celebration. What does the Bible say about celebration and so? Ladies and gentlemen, fashion your seat belts. We're getting ready to take off. Unless you want to jump and shout in the middle of this. It wouldn't hurt my feelings. Are y'all hot back there? Is it warm back there? It feels pretty good up here. Anyway, everybody, everybody look at me and say, Pastor Drew, Pastor Drew, we forgive you. So we forgive you. Listen, the concept of celebration as God's people is found throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
Over a year ago, I preached a message about having a song in captivity. And I asked the question, I said, how many of you remember the very first time that singing was mentioned in the Bible? And the first time they ever talk about singing was after they crossed the Red Sea. They got over into the, prom into the, the, the wilderness area. They got across the Red Sea out of Egypt. And who was it? Those emotional women. No. Oh, yeah. oh. That's what they say. That's what they'll tell you. I'm waiting for the time when men get emotional. Amen. You know what? It's almost become demon possessed as pockets in men. Got their hands in their pockets. Lord delivers from demon, demonic pockets. I'll stop there. But Miriam, who was, who was um, Moses' sister, and the ladies, they begin to sing and they begin to dance. They had the tambourines. And it was the first time in Scripture that singing was ever mentioned. And so where, where did they learn to sing and dance and play the tambourine? They learned in Egypt... They learned in their captivity. Right. And they celebrated. Listen, modern day Pharisees would look at Miriam and say, hey, hey y'all y'all need to tone that down. <laughs> Give me those tambourines. Y'all quit. This is not what we do. Is that right? All right. But listen, we know the Red Sea story. It's such a picture of how we're set free and how that they were slaves and, and, and they were set free because of the blood that was put over the doorpost. I mean, you know, it's, it's the blood that frees us today. And that blood enabled them to begin a journey. And as they went to the Red Sea, they looked back, who was, who was trying to get them? Pharaoh's army was coming. You see, Egypt speaks to us of the world, but Pharaoh speaks to us of the power of sin. Because as soon as you are set free from the blood, it's the power of sin that wants to come and grab you and pull you back. And what did they do? They went down into the waters of baptism in the Red Sea, and the power of sin was buried in the Red Sea. And they came out in victory. Listen, if you've been in slavery for 400 years and now they're killing your babies, you think that you'd have something to celebrate about? No, no, hey, y'all shouldn't be doing that. I know a guy who was preaching in a Romanian church, and you go to some of the Eastern European nations where I, I've been to three of them, Romania, Moldova, Bulgaria, and they're very stoic. Some of them, the women sit on one side and the men sit on the other. I was in a gypsy church down in the Black Sea in Romania, and only about... 40 or 50 people there, and men on one side and women on the other, and they had two guys playing the, what are they called? Um, accordions, uh, the squeeze buck, Chris. Their official name is accordion. And, uh, I mean, these guys, these guys threw their heads back, and you, talk, you have never heard two men sing as loud as these two guys, and they played, and they started singing. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a church in northern Romania that we've been invited to preach at. There's a thousand gypsies. How many of you know that'd probably be fun to go to a church in northern, northern Romania and, and watch a thousand gypsies? You think they're going to celebrate? You think they're going to dance? But the Romanian people themselves, 
were pretty docile. And this guy was going to preach, and he was sitting on the platform, and they were singing a song, and he was just sitting in a chair tapping his foot. And one of the leaders of the church came up on the platform and pointed to his foot and went, Well, we know the story of how that the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. In 1 Samuel 4, we, we read about when the Israelites fought the Philistines. And the Bible says that the Philistines killed 4,000 men. And they, and remember that number, everybody say 4,000. Remember that number because it's, it's significant later on here. Later in that chapter, the, the, uh, the Israelites realized that they needed the Ark of the Covenant. And because they hadn't used, they brought the Ark of the Covenant because they, they, were, they were living lives that weren't pleasing the Lord. And so anyway, the Philistines attacked them again and, and they, they, they stole, they took the Ark of the Covenant. And the Philistines even killed 30,000 more men. And they captured the Ark of the Covenant. And while the Philistines had the Ark, it didn't go so good for them. You can read about it, all kinds of things. And the, after seven months, they were fed up with their relationship with the Ark of the Covenant. And they pretty much said, you guys need to come get this thing. We don't know what to do with it. And so they... They, they took the Ark of the Covenant and it, and it stayed in the home of a, be, a man named Abinadab and the Ark of the Covenant stayed there for 22 years. And Abinadab's home was blessed. 22 years go by and David becomes king. And the first thing that David did he said, we need to go get the ark. The ark speaks to us of what? It speaks to us of the power and the presence of God. He said, we need the ark in our midst. And they gathered up the leaders and they went and they got the ark from the home, from the home where, uh, of uh, Abinadab. And of course, you know, the first time that they tried to take it up Mount Zion, there was a tragedy but then they finally figured out how that the priests were to carry the ark and they carried the ark up Mount Zion. Now the ark had been previously put in the tabernacle of Moses, but now David was doing something different. He took it up and he cleared out a place. It says that he, he cleared out a place for the, 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 the tent and he pitched the tent and they were bringing the ark up, and get, there was what? There was singing, there was dancing, there was celebration. David was even dancing. They had all kinds of music that was going on. David's wife looked out, and she didn't like the way he danced. She, she thought he was being undignified, and all, all, all. we know the whole story. But listen, there was celebration. Now, here's the thing about all that. So David's got the ark on top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Five miles away, there was a mountain called Mount Gibeah. And you know what was on top of Mount Gibeah? Was the tabernacle of Moses. And if you study the tabernacle of Moses, you walk in into the outer court and there was the brazen altar where they sacrificed the animals. And then they went over to the laver where the priest washed his hands. And then they went into the holy place where they had a table of showbread where the priest would eat the, the bread that was made daily. And then they had seven golden candlesticks that they, they lit. And there's all kinds of, of symbolism here I, I don't have time to get into. And then they went and, and they had the altar of incense. But then there was a veil. Remember the veil that was talking? There was a, a curtain. And the priest once a year would go behind that curtain. And guess what happened when he would go behind the curtain? 
nothing because the ark was on top of Mount Zion. Remember the 4,000 soldiers that were killed? Well, guess what David does the first thing? He probably remembering those times when those 4,000 soldiers were killed because he appointed 4,000 singers and musicians to sing and play and rejoice and write songs while they were on Mount Zion. And they didn't have to wait just once a year for the priests to go up there. Anybody from the north, the south, the east, or the west, everybody say, that's me, anybody. And anybody could walk directly up to the presence of God and there was singing, 4,000 singers and musicians singing 24 hours around the clock. And the whole time they're singing, the Pharisees, they're still offering sacrifices on Mount Gibeah. They're singing sacrifices of praise over here. They're, they're washing their hands. They're eating the table from the table of showbread and the golden... And they're going through all of their rituals. But guess what? There's no song, there's no life, and there's no presence. It's a picture of what we have in the church today of churches, I'm sure. Don't you think they pointed their finger at Mount Zion and said, look at those crazy people? Singing those crazy songs. We just read your psalms. Because about half of them were written by David or other people that were on top of Mount Zion. Asaph. You read in their psalm, it says a psalm of Asaph. Asaph was the chief musician that led all 4,000 and you had to be skilled. You just didn't say, well, I play the guitar a little bit. No, you, it says they were all skilled. And they played and they sang and they rejoiced. And psalm after psalm after psalm came out of Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. So the psalms are full of scriptures talking about celebrating. Psalms 95, verse 2. Psalm 68, verse 3, tells us to rejoice with gladness. Have you ever seen anybody singing about rejoicing, but they weren't glad? What was that old chorus we used to sing? Rejoice in the Lord always. And, you know, you can't sing that song without clapping, tapping your feet. But there's people that sing it like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I sing rejoice. <laughs> Do you know that one of the meanings for the word rejoice means to spin around? To twirl around? Y'all better quit that. Don't, you're not supposed to act that way in church. We don't sing those kind of songs. That's of the flesh. Psalms 118, 15. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. In other words, even at home, there's joyful sounds of shouting in the tents of the righteous. Psalm 45, 15, they will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. 95, 1, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Come and let us sing. What time is it? How are we doing? 11, what? 50. I got a little something here. I was in Flagstaff. When I write a song, I pick up my guitar or guitar, depending on where you live. 
And I, uh, I just started playing a little dilly. <laughs> Let's see what I got here. I got about 10 minutes of that, just me. I just, I just turn these on, and I pick up my guitar, and I start singing, and every now and then I start singing something. That, a song may come out of that. But I just sing a new song. Bob says sing a new song, and so I just start. That's, that's the way most of my songs that I've, I've written. It's it, the, the, the songs of cel celebration, you know. Uh, let the people of God rise up. I mean, uh, it's, you know. Psalms 30, 11, you've turned my morning to dancing. Yeah. Dancing. Yeah. We don't dance in church. Yeah, we do. Nothing wrong with it. I have a hard time putting my pants on in the morning, much less dancing anymore. But anyway, yeah. but anybody wants to dance, you can dance. You can dance. Amen. That's why Renee sits in the front row. She likes a lot of room. <laughs> right. Psalms 149. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. I'm going to read Psalms 149 and 150. It says, Hallelujah, it's time to sing God a brand new song yeah. so that all his holy people will hear how wonderful he is. Break forth with dancing. <laughs> now, Miriam, you, Mary, you put, you ladies, put that tambourine up. Or Paul, you and Silas, quit singing so loud. I'm trying to sleep over here in this jail. <laughs> you guys shut up. Listen, there's a segment of, out there of Christianity that's trying to silence our song. Verse 3, break forth with dancing, make music, and sing God's praises with the rhythm of drums. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I like drums. I remember the first time I carried drums into a church in West Phoenix when I was a youth director for the whole west side of Phoenix for the Assemblies of God. And you'd have thought I'd carried a demon from hell in that church. Is that Pastor... For me, we don't do those drums in this church, those, those beats from the demons of Africa. You're not bringing those drums into this church. They found that guy in bed with a prostitute, $100 a night prostitute. Dead.
Yeah, he should have played the drums. Verse 5, his godly lovers triumph in the glory of God. God's high and holy praises fill their mouths for their shouted praises are the weapons of war. What's our weapons of war? The shouted praises are our weapons of warfare. These warring weapons will bring vengeance on the nations and every resistant power to bind kings with chains and rulers with iron shackles. That's what happens when we celebrate. People walk in here with chains just like Paul and Silas in that prison with those other people in chains. And every shackle broke off when they sang. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his holy sanctuary. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. Praise him with trumpets blasting. Not just a little blast. Trumpets blasting. Praise him with, they say harp, the original says harp and lyre, but here it says praise him with the piano and, or, and, and guitar, Chris. Amen. I'm sorry, but what we let Chris and, and Cameron and Ben do in this church, most churches won't. One guy that we trained, one guy that they, that they gave guitar lessons to was playing at another church and they let him do a little solo and they shut that down so fast because they said, that's just the flesh you want people to see. No, that's a gift that God gave to be released to the body of Christ and to see people set free. Praise him with drums and dancing. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Praise him with high sounding cymbals. Let everyone everywhere join in the crescendo of ecstatic praise to Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Did you know when you study the Psalms and how many times in the Psalms does it say, praise the Lord? So many times. But did you know that there are eight different words in the Psalms that are from the Hebrew that are used for the word praise? And this is what they mean. I've got a whole teaching. I'm not doing the whole teaching. I'm just real quick. First one is halal. It means to boast or brag. It means to rave about God to the point of appearing foolish. Yada, worship with extended hands. It says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord with extended hands. Well, I don't know if we believe in all that raising your hand stuff. Everybody raise your hands. I've got a picture. Matter of fact, I'll just get it out. We got time for this? Mitch, look at that. Who's that on that platform? Nope. Who's that on that platform? Uh, Micah. Is that Micah? No. Crystal, though, who this is. 
I need somebody young got some eyes here. You can see. If I could see it, I'd probably know. That is Mick Jagger. That's Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. 1975 Life magazine. There's his buddy playing the guitar. Now listen, so right there, he's up on a crane. They're lowering him down to a crowd. What's the crowd doing below him? Stand up and show me what they're all doing. There's, there's 70,000 people in Arizona State University Stadium all standing there. Mick Jagger's up on a crane on a platform. They're let, lowering him down, and they're all like this. And they'll come to church and tell us we're nuts. I don't know how he's still alive, but I mean, I get sick taking too much aspirin and he, all he's done. I don't know. What, anyway, <laughs> to worship with extended hands. We had a guy come to our church one time. He's a great big guy. He married a gal who had a background and she was in a Pentecostal charismatic church and she liked to sit on the front row. She ain't sat in no back row, Stephen. She, she liked to sit on the front row. And so if he was going to sit with his wife, he had to sit with her in the front row. He was six foot four and weighed 260 pounds. And you couldn't miss him. And if you sat behind him, you wouldn't go to see nothing. Because it was like when he walked through the door, it was like a total eclipse when, 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 when took place. And uh, he sat on the front row. And we started worshiping people few hundred people there after about three months I mean, first he was he had the hands in the pockets after about three months he was like this after about three more months he was like this after about six months total Worship with extended hands. Every child that's here, when they reach out to their father or whoever they're with, and they want to be, be embraced, they do this. It, I'm telling you, and you know what else? This right here is surrender in any language. Any wars... They, soldiers come out and they surrender. We surrender to the Father. We adore Him. We worship Him. We worship with extended hands. The other one, it means Barak. It means to denote a blessing. There's one called Tehila, Not Tequila, but Tehila. It means to sing or laud. And it involves music and singing. This is Old Testament. This is what the word praise means. Another one is zamar. It means to pluck a stringed instrument. Well, it's just not biblical to play those guitars. Yes, it is. Zamar, it says that Psalms, Psalms 18, 1 through 3, talks about when it says praise you the Lord, it means to pluck a stringed instrument. It's biblical. And it's a joyful expression of music. Number six, toda. It means to shout or address with a loud voice. And then shabak is very similar to that. It means to shout with a loud voice. And then the last one is hallelujah. That's a combination of two words. Halal means to boast or brag. Jah is the name of God. So when we say hallelujah, we're boasting and bragging on our God. Amen. You know what will change this community? 
a church that learns to celebrate? You want to know the greatest celebration that I've ever been in my life? It wasn't in a church. It was at a Mexican wedding. I had a nephew that married a Hispanic gal in Phoenix, and we went out there. And the light-colored people were of very few. And there was probably 200 Hispanics there that were all related and friends. And you never saw people dance and celebrate in this wedding. They took the groom, who's Phyllis's, he's our nephew, and he's a pretty big guy. And about eight or ten of those little Hispanic guys took him and got him on his back and threw him up in the air and catching him. I came back and I said, that's the way the church should be. You know, that's the way the church should, we should celebrate. I'm not saying we're going to grab, grab Gary and throw him up in the air, but, but I'm telling you, they celebrated their faces off. And then if you turn to Nehemiah 12, and I'm just about through. And Susie said, You ever watch Renee's grandkids up here? There's something in kids that know how to celebrate. Stephen and Justin's daughter, when we're practicing, she comes dancing down the aisle. Eloise. Because there's something in us that wants to celebrate our God. But we train them up and tell them not to. Nehemiah 12 and verse 27, remember they, Nehemiah went back to rebuild the walls. And when they got the walls rebuilt, they had a celebration. It said, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of somewhere, and from Beth something, Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and whatever. For the singers had built villages. Listen, the singers built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. And when the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. But anyway, they brought all... They brought all these people, singers and musicians, to dedicate the wall. And then in verse 43, it says this. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard from far away. I want the rejoicing in this place to be heard at, at, at McClure's when people are getting gas. You cannot believe the number of people that walk by here going to the liquor store or they're headed to the medical marijuana store or they're headed to get whatever. Let sound of celebration and rejoicing abound from this place. And then, of course, the last thing people say, well, that's all in the Old Testament. And the churches that don't believe in music, they always say there's no, no music in the, in the New Testament. 
And I tell them, I said, well, if Jesus talked about music, do you think it'd be okay? Well, uh, so then I take them to the story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15. We know the story. How the, the, the son, the younger son went and did his own thing. And when he came back, the father ran to him. And they said, let's, cel let's celebrate, kill the fat. He kissed him and they threw a party. And the son that was out in the field came. And what is, did it say? It said that he heard from afar, he heard music and dancing. Now, I can understand hearing music, but you got to really be cutting the rug for them to hear dancing. Maybe that's where clogs started. I don't know. You ever seen a clogging? When they clog and they, I, I don't know what a clog is, but anyway. But they heard, Jesus told the story. He celebrated, they'll preach about the, they'll preach about the prodigal son. They'll talk. They'll preach it up, but they won't ever talk about he heard music and dancing and that the father threw a celebration and the father threw a party because the son came home. Let's all stand. Well, I've, I've preached about 10 messages. I have about 10 separate messages there that I paraphrased. Everybody take a hand. Nobody look around. Just take, take, take a hand or two and just lift it to Jesus. Jesus, we declare today. Matter of fact, right where you are, just lift a hand and just begin to bless him. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. May we always be a people that know how to celebrate you unashamedly we're going to play and we're going to sing and dance and lift hands and clap and rejoice and pray for people and minister and rejoice in your goodness because you're a great God you're a great God and may we be Jesus said let the little children come to me may we be like little children that are so innocent, they love to celebrate, they love to dance, they love to sing.